Stuart, I can't thank you enough for doing this very high tech interview tour of your studio. We're really grateful that you're smarter than a lot of people think you are, probably your kids especially, in the use of this technology. Oh, but I've learned, I've, I've learned everything I know from my youngest son. Without my youngest son, I, I would be a cripple. Aren't we lucky? Yes. The new world, and here we are. But we are so grateful for your willingness to work with our center and to teach with us. Uh, you're really an important part of our educational program, and I'm, I just want to tell you how grateful I am for that. Thank you, Chuck. Well, I always, I've always enjoyed coming out to Sedona and being at the center because it's, um, it's an exciting and inspiring place to be. I have a son who is a, uh, a professor of art and, uh, and a contributor to the Museum of Modern Art and a well-written author in the art world. And so I ask him, what's what his question? Name? Should, huh? What's his name? His name is the same as mine, Spence, and his first name is Bradley Spence. Um, and uh, so I asked him, I said, Brad, and I showed him your work. What, what should I ask you if I want to appear to be smarter than, than I really am? And he said, well, obviously your work has really changed over the years. There have been dramatic changes in how you see the art world and both in what you paint, your palette, your style. Um, and so I want to come back to that as it deals with students that you might be teaching with us who could help understand that that's okay. But can you tell us just a little bit as a part of an introduction, how has your work changed so dramatically over the years? And we'll see some of it in the studio. Yeah, well, of course, Chuck, you realize that's a question for a long dinner with six bottles of wine. You know, <laughs> the answer, because the answer is not so simple, but I could, I could sum it up like this. Um, we've both lived a long time. We're not the same in appearance as we were when we were five years old, 10 years old, 20 years old, 30 years old, 40 years old, 50 years old, 60 years old, but we're the same person. But the appearance at every stage of life is different. I mean, there's no, I mean, when I have photographs of myself from when I'm two years old, when in my apartment, and when people come in, they see it and they say, oh, it looks like you, but it doesn't really look, I mean, it's a different version of me. Um, and I think that in a very simplistic way, but in a very direct way, it's the same with our work that, you know, a good therapist tells us when we go to therapists at moments of like threshold crises in our lives, you know, times that we need someone to help us work out a, a, a new way of framing what's going on in our life or what's understanding in our life. They tell us that one of the most important things is authenticity, you know, authenticity and also vulnerability and that conditioning contributes to the annihilation of, of, of the potential of authenticity because conditioning means that we have taken things that have been told to us or whatever and um, allowed them to determine the form of our thoughts. And in, for those of us who chose the path of art, and I'm not sure that the arts are necessarily the only place, but it's the only place that I know. I mean, I don't know if say for instance, someone in the business world potentially grows in the same way that an artist might grow. Maybe they do. But I think potentially, if someone is open to looking at the world around them and to thinking about what is, what is their feeling, what is their response, how do they use materials, what is the nature of the object that they're making, if we come to this with preconceptions, we're breaking our legs. Um, that, you know, to me, expectations are the jailer. It took me a long time to understand this, but expectations are really like a jailer. They, they keep us enclosed in a, 
in like a, a calcified idea of who we are. And if we are moving through our lives, and if we're living in the visual world, it doesn't matter what we're doing, whether we're working two-dimensionally, three-dimensionally, photography, sculpture, play, it doesn't matter, wood, paint. If we're moving through the world and we're alive, and we're actually considering the taste of what's in front of us and how we interact with it and what the meaning of all this is, then how can I possibly make the same response um, in, in 1994 that I would make in 2004, right? Like the whole idea here is that we're trying, I mean, the, uh, for me, what I came to understand is that the tools of art are the keys for being open to the world in front of me. And I might be, I mean, I spent a good bit of time in my life looking at the sky, but my idea of what the sky was or what the sky could be, or the role that the sky played, or how to even think about the meaning of representation, representation, has to change because I'm changing. You know, we're changing throughout the course of our lives and our work goes with us. Does, you know what I mean? Yeah, and I'd, I'd like you to talk about that in terms of when you're dealing with students who all come with expectations, who all come with baggage, how do you help them free up from that anxiety or, or those restrictions to, right. to get to where, even close to where you are? How do you help them do that? I always tell students that um, I'm neither Jesus Christ, Moses, nor Muhammad. <laughs> I can't. I can't radically transform their lives in three days, in three weeks, in three years. Um, we're, this is a long game, but what I, the, 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 the metaphoric analogy that I, that I always use at the end of my classes is I basically tell them, it's up to you. You know, I'm just here to present you with a set of ways of thinking that are hopefully contributing to eroding or to tempting you, to eroding what you think you know or what you know, or by tempting you into coming to other places that you haven't necessarily considered. And that all I can offer is, is a seed to take home in a peat pot. Like when we were in second grade and we were doing agriculture and the teacher gave us a little peat pot with a seed in it. And he or she said, you basically have to take this home and put it on the windowsill. I can't change someone's life in three days. I can't change someone's life in a class, but I can throw at them a set of considerations that if they are willing to, to recognize these things as tools for the possibility of self-transformation, that they can take them home and work on them. When we look at your work and your work over many years, your transformation is clear. and so. I hope when you're teaching, you're able to share who you were 30 years ago and 10 years ago. Well, but you also have to remember that I am not there to teach anyone how to be me or how to do like me. You see, there are many people who do workshops. The, the purpose is to teach the students how they do it. I've never subscribed to that kind of, of, of uh, process. I'm, I'm there to introduce the students to the actuality of their own perception. So that they, because what I'm after is not methodology, is not materials and techniques, is not how to. I'm after how to open their eyes. And can you tell when that has happened? Are you able to see with a student when that's happening? Well, of course, there are degrees. I'm able to see it. I'm able to see it in the first hour of the first day. Because, okay, good, good. You know, but we're not talking about what well, I'm able to see thinking. I'm able to see real consideration come into play, but I'm, I'm not able to see, you know, massive self-transformation. That, that's an unrealistic expectation. You know, that's like when, 
I got in touch with my youngest son and said, look, can you recommend how I should invest? I have a little money I want to invest because I need to make some quick dough. He said, that's very risky. You know, it's probably not going to work that way. You're better off looking at long-term, stable investment. We're looking here, we're looking at something longer than the flash of the moment. But what I always aspire to accomplish in the class is to help to tear people away from the expectations and the conditioning that they arrive with. In other words, to show them the possibility of a way of looking at the world and then a way of looking at their work that is going to challenge all the underlying assumptions, perhaps, of what they think the truth is. It's a very risky place for people. I mean, I've had people, I've had people call me like an effer in the class. Yes, because, I understand. Because right. it's getting a little too close for comfort. Like, I'm not interested in people staying in the comfort zone. I want to, I want to rip them out of the comfort zone as quickly as possible. But not, we're not talking about like brutality. But when, when, you, when students say, Stuart, this is the best thing that you did for me, or this is the best thing I got from your class, what are they talking about? They're, they're probably talking about um, acquiring the sense of freedom not to have to listen to all the BS that they've, been, that they've heard in the world as the rules. That's really big. That's wow. a huge thing. I mean... I, I didn't want to raise my children to follow anybody's rules. I, I mean, I wanted them to be good students, but you know, what I learned from raising children is that when I, when I want my expectations to become the lives of my children, that's where I'm in trouble. Right. If I just recognize who they are and take great pride in the quality of difference, knowing that of course we're tied together, but you know, it must be a brutal situation when children think they have to conform to the expectations of their parents. I mean, we know what it does to people and we know how much some of us had to take a big ax and start smashing into the walls of the house, so to speak, to get away from it all. So the, I, in, a, in a similar way, I'm trying to, um, to persuade students that they have a voice that, should, that, that it's their voice, you know, it's, it's who they are that they are cultivating, not somebody else's rules. You know, you're kind of an artistic Plato. You're asking the right questions and making them think. <laughs> but that's a compliment. I mean, you know, that's, if we're, not, if we're not making them think, then what are we doing? You know, we're just creating robots. Um, you know, I want people to understand that their point of view matters and that their point of view is who they are and that the development of that, the cultivation of that, the shaping of that takes time, but it also takes trust. So that as we move, because we all have those voices in our head, am I doing it right? Will the gallery like it? Is this what they want me to do? The last one sold, is this one going to sell? You know, all those questions. It's just like when we were in fifth grade and we didn't know the answer to a question on the test and we looked at the person next to us. They didn't know the answer either. They were looking at us. You probably have a lot of students coming in with the kind of anxiety that you described, you know, am I supposed to be like him? Am I, is this a certain way that I've got to paint? And you free them up from that. That's huge. Well, look, Chuck, I can't, I'm not making any promises. I, I just do what I can. And I might be able to free them up uh, in, the, in the days of our class. But then, you know, the, for me, the huge question is, what are they going to be able, what are they going to carry away? Because that's where the real work begins, right? The real work begins with what they are able to carry away. So that my classes tend to be focusing on a fairly narrow set of concerns. 
because I want to highlight and underscore what I think is most important, which basically is the clarity of our seeing. And that's why all my classes are run by observation, because observation is the beginning of all conversation. I, I, I mean, I work in a school where I go into people's studios and I look at the paintings that they've made over the course of the semester and I talk to them about them, but I'm serving, I'm, I'm wearing a different hat there. In a classroom, in a classroom where we're dealing with a certain kind of dynamic situation where I'm using it, I'm using observation as the beginning of the conversation, basically like, how do we clarify our seeing? You know, I'm, I'm really delighted that you're willing to do that one-on-one -on -one with students. That's so powerful. Thank you for being willing to take that time uh, because that's really strong learning uh, when they've got that time with you. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a process and, you know, it's a conversation. And, and well, remember, something that can happen when you're talking to someone one-on-one -on -one that can't happen in a class necessarily, right? The class is a collective conversation. Right. Okay, I noticed uh, that your studio is a lot tidier than when we talked the other day. So <laughs> have, yeah. have you been closing drawers just to impress us here? Yeah, I wanted, I wanted I to. <laughs> out before you we talked I was in the midst of a work day and you know I put some things out because I thought you were gonna ask me some questions related to maybe this idea of different stages of my life so I put out examples of some different stages what would you like to show us can you give what us would, a little would like that a, a little tour yeah okay yeah this is um this is the first room of my studio the entry room um cabinet with work on paper drawings it's an old monotype and um i have racks with um things and flat files kind of out the wazoo that have um drawers with paintings here's a very here's a painting from like 1988 or 1989 it's a neighborhood i used to live in uh, and then this is my working room. I have a wall here with different things. Oh, I have a couple areas where I hang things that are of interest to me. This has gotten a little bit bleached out, but it's a painting by the Scottish painter Joan Erdley, who died tragically young. She lived out on one of those islands like the Outer Hebrides. This is a photograph I took in Mirandi's studio in Bologna many years ago. That's a close up. Um, this is a, uh, it's a reproduction of a Lorenzetti. This is a, a landscape by the now deceased painter Jake Berteau. This is a Quentin Bell ceramic plate. Um, this is a low, a very early Lois Dodd, I think. Early, I'm not sure. There's a Mirandi drawing. Over here, I have other things, photographs of the cards of a, some favorite painters of mine. That's Susan Jane Walp. There's a Ken Culey collage that I think was a New Year's card. Um, and this is my working space. I have wonderful light. And, you know, we can, I'm just giving you a scan of the working space. Um, these, you know, these are drawers related to the kinds of tools that I'm using now to make a variety of, of objects. But for many years, I was a kind of, I was a painter working out of doors. This painting is maybe um, 1992. And this is when I was still framing my oils on paper 
under museum glass, but you know, you can see what this is, I, I hope. It's an outdoor painting that's maybe 14 inches wide, oil paint. And I would make these paintings outside. And I, I was very lucky, beginning around 1991, I started selling paintings and I had the freedom for many years to just paint. Um, and I spent 13 summers on the northwest coast of Ireland. My, my grandmother grew up in Ireland. We were Russian Jews, refugees, and a lot of Jews got dumped by English shipping companies in Belfast. And um, unexpectedly, I ended up in Ireland from the mid 90s to 2006. I, my children grew up there running down lanes and, and I was making landscape paintings there. Um, but it rained all the time. And I began to understand that rain brings with it its own language and that everything kind of melts. You know, so the kind of experiences that I was having in Philadelphia, this is about a 13 by 13 inch oil painting from 1995. This is who I was when I first went to Ireland in 1994. I was, I was making paintings that had foreground, middle ground, background, rationally understood space with a certain kind of clarity and also a certain connection to the history of painting perhaps. And, and what- and you're didn't own a Dremel then? Oh, I didn't own a Dremel. I just had, I just had me brushes and me, and me paints. Um, right. You know, I was, I, was a, I was a traditional landscape painter, but what began to happen in the late 90s on a particular wet summer was I began to understand that there's more to landscape than the little cottage and me neighbor's cows across the way like. Right, like I began, to, I began to become fascinated by rain and what rain and pe because remember I'm living in a place where the air is like a turbine, you know, like all day long. I mean, this is on the Northwest tip of Mayo. You know, it's the most insane weather system in, in Ireland. And what I had to do, I mean, here's a drawing. This is me in 1984. It's ink and it's about 16 inches wide, right? And these are the kinds of paintings that in the late, in the early, in the late eighties, I was doing in Philadelphia. So I was coming to the idea of landscape with a certain set of expectations. And Ireland released for me it was like one of the most important experiences of my life to, um, to begin to understand that there are ways of, of reading landscape and of using landscape rather than just submitting to the, um, to the conditioned expectations of history. And of course, you know, the, find the brain paintings are really good teaching tools and the way you describe them and what happened to them and how they how they impact you that's really good teaching Stuart to share that oh great here's another example uh chuck this painting is probably from 2000 2000 the year 2000 now this painting is probably from 2014 or 15. And you can see it's much larger. You, you can see them in relationship to one another. But at a certain point, I began to understand that I'm not just like copying what's there, that I also have my own response. Now, this didn't happen until I started spending my summers in Italy. I stopped going to Ireland in 2006 for a variety of complex reasons, but, but a lot of it had to do with the response of my galleries to these paintings, which of course people in Ireland, people in Ireland loved. In 2005, these were selling for like 5,500 euro, 
in Ireland. Um, the I mean I would when I would have, when I had my show in Cork, I met people who could speak, and the farmers I knew the farmers I knew in my village, they could speak with such eloquence about the weather, and about the meaning of the weather. You know, it's like it's like they all had PhDs in feeling. Um, but you know, you bring paintings like this back to America. And people look at you and they say, like, what on, what on earth is going on? Um, so, and, and that has to do with the marketplace. That has to do with, come on, I told you, like, I wanted another four boxes of last season's stuff. You know, and this, this, isn't what, this isn't what the engagement is about. Here's another Irish painting. This is a very small one. But, you know, it's in a kind of dark corner. But you can see that at this point, I'm trying to understand how to put into paint a moment of great transition. Transitory, the weather. Now, in 2006, it was my last trip and I spent the next four or five summers in Italy. And an entirely different teaching, but with very minimal teaching responsibilities, an entirely different kind of um, concern emerged that unlocked color and also, I want to show you something because this is very important in my own development. Um, in Italy, I began to see for the first time, of course, I'd gone to the Metropolitan. I grew up going to museums, you know, as a younger guy. Uh, I was a museum rat. But for going to Italy as an adult for the first time, I saw the early Italian Renaissance. And we could be talking about Giotto, Orsino Martini, um, more Giotto, um, all of this stuff began, I became fascinated and obsessed with these kinds of paintings. Now look at this, right? Like, look at that. This is, remember, I was, I was raised in a Russian Jewish family. What did we know from, from the big guy here on his cross? Um, but I came to understand the first trip I went over there, um, I was working for a school in Israel that exists today, but in a very different format. And I'm not connected with it anymore. But I remember we took a trip one day up to um, Urbino to see a painting by Piero della Francesco called The Flagellation of Christ, that many painters I know consider to be one of the most important paintings in the history of art. I don't have a copy of it here, um, but it's very easy to access. And it lives in the Ducal Palace in Urbino, and you have to walk in a whole bunch of rooms, and you come to this painting, and I stood there, we were in the room for maybe two hours, and I watched secular Israelis stand in front of this painting and cry. And I had to ask myself, what, what's this all about? Like, what is holding their attention? Because we're not talking about the binding of Isaac or an Old Testament story, we're talking about the crucifixion. And what do secular Israelis know from the crucifixion for the most part? Like, they're not connected to this, you know, by way of the, you know, the stories that you grew up with. Well, what they were, what they were responding to was <coughs> the insane power of the painting. And that power is not rooted in the subject matter. It's not about the subject matter. It's about the form. And we could then ask the question, what's the difference between good painting and bad painting? Well, every Italian museum has many, many paintings in the basement. And they're probably gonna be there for a very long time and they might not see the light of day. Well, why is that? Well, I mean, why do we go back and look at the flagellation of Christ by Piero della Francesco? Why do we go to a CC over and over and over again? I've been to a CC five or six times. Why do I want to go in and look at these frescoes by Giotto, the story of St. Francis? These are not the stories of my people historically, but I have spent hours in front of, you know, in this church, chapel, 
because the paintings are tremendous and it's all about form. And it's just like when I was in, uh, when I was 12 and 13 years old and I was already listening to rock and roll, you know, I'm listening to songs that begin like, dun, 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 you know, and you know, this, this songwriter understood that, that what you're trying to do is make a tune that is going to grab the ear of the listener. It could also be, um, dun, 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 Or if you go back in time, dun, 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 the bird catcher song from the magic flute. You know, the whole point of music is to grab the listener as deeply and as quickly as possible. And that's done through the notes and the chords, and that's form. There are no words. And, and the, 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 the thing that these paintings really hammered home for me is the, the primacy, you know, the, the primary importance of form. That for, you know, it doesn't matter what the painting is of. What we are concerned about with is what's going on between the four edges. You know, what, what are the political dynamics? And, um, and, and in Italy, I started getting impacted by this abstract form. And I began to think that it's time to not go outside anymore and make paintings. Um, but to tr begin, you know, like these were all done out of doors, but begin to understand what is the role of a different kind of memory. And the more present we can be in front of nature, and in also the more present we can be by observation of nature, means the more present we can be in the observation of our work. And that's the interface. You're really teaching. Mindfulness. Mindfulness. Totally visual mindfulness, Chuck. And that, if you ask people to describe the paintings or pieces of art that had the most impact on them that they remember, they will they'll answer with the kinds of things that you've described. I, they may I, not be the most important I, pieces of art, but they'll have had an impact on their emotional mindful state. Mindfulness is really the only thing we're after. You know, to be, to be present and to understand that when we're making a drawing, I put out a few drawings. These are, these are pencil drawings. These are older drawings. Um, more recent drawings might look like this. I spent a summer in Greece two summers ago. Now talk about a place that completely took me away. A lot changed there for me. So this is a drawing, but this is done with crayons and pencil. When we're working, whatever it is we're working with or on, it's all about drawing. Drawing is the fundamental portal. Because, you know, here's, here's an object that I made about a year ago. I went to architecture school many years ago for a couple of years before I went to art school. So this stuff is, is coming out in ways that I couldn't have anticipated when I was a painter. Uh, we're looking down in the floor plan. There's a little figure back there that's a piece of plastic here, two people sleeping on the roof deck um it's all like where did where did where does all this come from like here's here's another object i've been working on um like where did the, did the decisions come from the decisions on where to cut into material where to saw where to score it's all drawing it took incredible nerve for you to do that, I think, because it, you weren't destroying it, you were letting it loose. 
that's the whole, the whole point of this, Chuck. Like, here's a recent drawing. I've been drawing with Dremels into paper. I'm gonna get closer so you can see the surface. This is like paint and collage. Um, and I, I have a bunch of them over here. Like these are drawings done with the Dremel into paper that's been painted. And here's, here's an object, this is wood. Um, and you know, for, and this is, oh, I'm getting a cast shadow there. This is, um, this is a piece of wood that's been painted and then cut into with chisels and things like that. Look, you know, there's a story that I often tell about um, the three children, right? The, 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 the first kid leaves home in the morning and the mother or the father says, uh, come right home after school, don't forget, come right home after school. The kid's walking home from school. I'm gonna turn the camera around for a minute. Um, the, the kid comes home from school, the kid's walking home from school. And uh, do you know this story, Chuck? Have I told you this story before? Perfect. Did I tell you this story before about the three children? No. Right, so the, the kid leaves home in the morning and the mother, the one of the parents say, don't forget, come right home after school. Kids walking home from school at the end of the day, comes to a familiar intersection, stops, wait for the light to turn, turns to the right. And it's like, oh my God, in Beverly's yard is a new Labradoodle. And the kid wants to run three houses up and look at the Labradoodle. But the kid hears the voice and don't forget, come right home after school. Right. The kid goes home. Next kid leaves home in the morning. Parent says, don't forget, come right home after school. Kid's coming home from school. Kid comes to the intersection, barely stops because they're holding, I don't know, they're like texting, you know, whatever it is they do. Um, they're not even looking. They're not even aware of what's there. They don't see the new dog in the yard because they're in their own world. They're not present. Next kid leaves home in the morning, come right home after school. Kid's coming home, comes to the intersection, turns to the right and sees that like Bobby got a new German Shepherd halfway up the block. Kid just runs. That's the kid I'm interested in. Yeah. So. Describe for me, in the terms of those kids, the student that would be an ideal student of yours. How would they be like those children? Fearless. Fearless and open. Risk is the most important place to live. <clears throat> right? Without risk, there's not going to be any growth. Because how do we get from here to there? Well, this is one of the fundamental questions we're asking in a drawing class. How do I get from here to there? I have this piece of paper. I want to make a drawing. Where do I begin? Well, let's, where, I mean, where, you know, where does your eye go when you're looking? Like, where, I mean, these are large questions, um, but it's all risk because if you come to the idea of making a drawing from observation, um, usually most people come with a conditioned, set of expectations about procedure and how to go about it. And often, usually, those expectations undermine the possibility of being present. That, that most of us okay. see so if you the work could... students, our students, what are the two or three questions that you would like them to ask about themselves to determine whether they're really going to enjoy your class or benefit. Well, I don't know. I mean, they, they have to be open to wanting a new experience. You know, they have to be open to the possibility that they might be encountering something there that is unfamiliar and is challenging and potentially difficult. I mean, 
what I've seen over the 20 years of doing my classes is that um, people really appreciate that because a lot of people who take classes have taken so many classes where after time they say to themselves, what did I learn? I learned somebody else's way of doing something. And, and I, I've met people who for years have taken classes here, there, you know, they, they go from this class to that class, they go to Italy every year and they take a workshop with somebody. And it's usually not equipping them with the tools to really see clearly on their own, that we always think we need a crutch because we don't trust ourselves. We don't think that we know the answer. Well, there is no answer. The only answer is what we do. And what we do cannot be labeled right or wrong. Like for me, there is no right or wrong way to draw. What I wanna know is, is the drawing communicative? Is the drawing articulate? You know, like what is the drawing saying? Uh, you know, in terms of, if I look at it as the, as the viewer, as the audience, what dimensionality does the voice of the drawing have? So, you know, the, the primary thing that I'm concerned with in doing a drawing class is to expose them to the idea that with a pencil, even if we're just making a line drawing on a small piece of paper, what they aspire to understand is how to live in the saturation of the moment in the saturation of the moment, realizing that a moment has enormous interiority. You don't need to make a big painting or a big drawing for that. It has to, it's the way you use what you have. Usually, on the first day of class, if I ask people to, um, to make a drawing, I'm just trying to get this in a light. You know, they'll, they'll make a drawing like this. And I'm, I'm looking at the lines and I don't, know, I don't know where to go because they're kind of all the same. That they, there's, there's not much difference as opposed to as opposed to that. You see that? Where does your eye go? Your eye goes to the dark place because that's what the eye does. The eye is drawn to, and then, and then this line is different from that line, and this line is very different from that line. So already we are, we are expanding the, the possibility of the interiority of the drawing by way of thinking about the weight of the lines even if and and so why do you why are the lines different because of how we're seeing right not what we're seeing what we're seeing doesn't matter how we see is what this is about so Stuart, through the magic of technology you're going to present a workshop very soon uh you want to tell us some details about that workshop well, um, on the 24th and 25th, I believe, of July, in Zoom space, in, in Zoom space, we'll be doing um, a class, Reframing the Ordinary, which is a class rooted in exploring the elemental dynamics of observation by way of drawing. So you could say it's a drawing class, but we're also going to use collage. Uh, black and white paper, um, a few other uh, learning aids to basically address the question, um, what are the dynamics of the page? You know, because when, you know, if I look at a, this is a blank page, but if I turn it around, there's a drawing there. How did, how did I make the decisions about, I didn't just take reality and paste it here. I mean, the, the drawing, if you, in, in real life, you can see the drawing is enclosed in some lines, but all the decisions that are made in making a drawing 
are related to questions of how do we feel our way into the surface graphically. You know, how do we understand within the compression piece of paper, what can a pencil do, you know, other than like describe the names of things? We're trying to enter into the ab an, a feeling for the abstract palpability of the working surface and also for observations. So the class is three days, Friday, I believe Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I don't know exactly what the dates are, the 24th, 25th, and 26th, or something like that. And there's an opening talk the night before, which is um, required for everyone in the class because it's a, it's a presentation of some concerns of mine in which I'm trying by way of other people's work and photographs of the world around us to illuminate um, aspects of how we take, how we place ourselves visually in the world in front of us. That will be a foundation for the three days that are going to come ahead of us. So the talk is 90 minutes. And then also, um, once the class is finished, which I think is on Sunday, in the following week, there will be an opportunity for each participant to talk with me privately, uh, whether it's FaceTime or Skype or whatever they want, um, where we can talk privately about things that are of concern to them. So it'll be like, a, like having a private session where we can talk about whatever, whatever they, however they want to use the time, whether it's to talk about things that happened in the class or the application of these things to their studio practice or questions that they were afraid to ask because many people are embarrassed about asking questions because they think questions are dumb, you know, in, in public. So it'll be 30 minute opportunity for each participant to, for us to spend a little time together in whatever way is most useful for them. That's gonna be a life changer for a lot of people, by the way. It will be. Well, Thank I mean, you. You're welcome.